When it comes to bespoke shoes in London, there is one family-run business which epitomizes the virtues of quality, craftsmanship, and tradition more than anyone else, John Lobb. Established in 1849 and grantees of six warrants to the British royal family, John Lobb has been discreetly practicing its craft of making the best shoes in the world for over 150 years. After years of admiring their work, I've finally taken the plunge and commissioned my first pair of bespoke shoes from this legendary shoemaking company. So join me as I step inside the historic premise of John Lobb at number nine St. James's Street to meet with fifth generation family member, director, and bespoke last maker, Jonathan Lobb, to see these incredible shoes come to life. Jonathan. Kirby, uh, nice to meet you. So great nice to see you. Again. Yeah, it's nice to be uh, back in London. I have to say I'm really excited about today. I had the opportunity to um, you know, really see the last making at John Lobb, of course, you know, one of the preeminent shoemaking firms known for being an exceptional fitter, um, but also such an exceptional shoemaking firm. And as your great, great, great grandfather used to say, I mean, the last shall, shall be, be first. Built. Exactly. And so this is where it all begins. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, uh, I'm very excited about the prospect of showing you the process. It's something I've been involved in for, you know, some years now. So I've, yeah. I'm, I feel I'm fairly competent and fairly confident about what I do. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about Lobb is in, in some ways you could say the brain trust of this incredible heritage firm in some ways exists almost exclusively with the last makers. I mean, the last makers traditionally have been the ones you know, employed here exclusively for the firm. I and mean, there's always been other shoemakers, but it's the last makers that really continue and perpetuate this incredible tradition of well, shoemaking. Yeah, it's difficult. I and mean, we all work together without, yeah. the, last, without the shoemakers. I mean, the last makers would just be a fairly ab yeah. abstract. <laughs> it, is, it is something that um, I've had a great, you know, the great fortune of having been able to learn. Yeah. Really, it wasn't, obviously, I hadn't expected I would come a, a competent or capable yeah. last maker, but you know, one thing led to another, and one day followed on from the other. <laughs> I had the advantage of obviously learning from my father, yeah. and also the, my colleagues who I work with, and older members of the firm who have since left. Yeah. So I have accumulated, I've managed to accumulate a fair amount of, sort yeah. of experience and knowledge over that yeah. time. Well, you really are carrying on that family tradition mm. that has existed now for six generations in this firm. Yeah, it has. I mean, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I suppose a, a lot of the unique sort of position is it is a family business. Mm. And though I didn't necessarily come as a last maker originally, I, I spent some time shoemaking and making yeah. up as and learning the whole trade. Mm -hmm. I really settled down as a last maker. Yeah. Was there ever a period of time in Lobb's history where there wasn't a family member that was also making last? Um, yes, I suppose there was, because my, my uncle, my grandfather's brother, wasn't a last maker. Mm -hmm. And um, he, and uh, I speak, uh, my great grandfather, he was a last maker. Yeah, I suspect we've all been making last since to some degree. Yeah. And even the Joe, John Lobb, I wouldn't, yeah, I, I say I don't, we don't have the records, but mm -hmm. I imagine he was a competent, capable last maker. Yeah. But he was also coming from a time when you know, last makers were a trade in them, their own right. Yeah. As shoemakers, mm -hmm. as makers, last making was an independent skill and yeah. fitting. Yeah. So even going back to the original John Lobb, I respect he was pretty proficient at last yeah. making, but whether he was actually focused entirely on last making, I doubt that. Yeah. What do you think, um, is there a way in which this firm, you know, John Lobb approaches its trade and its craft of last making that you think, um, you know, is particularly unique or authentic to its beginnings? Well, I think what we've just discussed is, is unique to us. Yeah. Um, there are very few people who want to enter the trade as it is have the benefit of that experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it's not that we cultivated it, it simply is a con you know, we've managed to maintain and continue yeah. that existence. And going back, you, know, you only have to remember that as a shop, going back to when the firm was founded, most firms, small firms, were shops, they were family owned businesses, and that was a means by which families would yeah. continue in the same way the maker would be a maker and he would train his son. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, 
you know, it's the way that things yeah. worked in the past. Yeah, and one of the other things that, you know, astounds me as I've had the privilege of spending more time is how this, uh, you know, this accumulation of knowledge, this, you know, this excellence isn't just with the last makers, but you kind of alluded to this mm -hmm. earlier. It's with everyone that's involved in the entire process of creating the shoe. And I can't help but think that whenever one you know, has the privilege in his life to acquire a pair of John Lobb shoes, uh, that the sum is greater than the parts. Yeah, well, you're quite right. I mean, when, even when you're talking about the last itself, we are always, there are, there are references to the other parts of the business. You know, when you're making a last, you're making it for a maker. So you are keeping the, the actions of the maker and the closer yeah. in mind when you make your last. I mean, even you know, to have the last made, we have another premises um, which comes under, it's under part of the company, but it's originally it was an independent company called Henry Peen. Okay. And in the making of the last, um, that involves going from the raw material, mm -hmm. the wood, to what we call a rough turn. Yeah. And that is what I need as a last maker to then make. So I'm dependent on the premises that we have and yeah. Henry Peen in order to make the last that I make. Yeah. And that is something we'll go into as we go yeah. through the process. Yeah. And so, you know, Lab isn't relying, you know, at this point uh, on any outside firms to provide those rep turns, you're actually creating them yourself. Yeah, we have our own premises and our own lathes. Yeah. And um, we take the we take the <clears throat> planks of wood. Yeah. And we work them into a last. Yeah. I, mean, as, I mean, as part of this last making process, mm -hmm. what I would like to do is take you through essentially from plank to finish. Wow. So in order to do that, we invite you to come visit our premises uh, in Henry Peen. Okay. And we'll look at the process from there. Yeah, so literally, you know, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. There are, of course, other talented bespoke shoemaking firms, not just in London, but around the world. However, John Lobb is singular in the fact that its tradition of last making has been passed down from generation to generation, now for over 150 years, entirely uninterrupted. There is no other bespoke shoemaking firm in the world that rivals Lobb's heritage. In many ways, John Lobb has become the custodian of this incredible craft and its traditions. From the rough turns of the raw lasts to the last making, making of the shoes, to even the creation of the shoe trees, with the only exception of a number of Lobb trained traditional outworkers, this work is done completely in-house. The reputation of John Lobb is built on the accumulation of knowledge and experience passed down seamlessly through five generations of the Lobb family. It is this provenance that makes a pair of shoes from John Lobb possibly the most prestigious of any pair of bespoke shoes in the world. The process of creating a bespoke last, which is a wooden representation of the customer's foot, begins with the rough turning of a pair of lasts from a block of solid wood. So in our journey together, we first travel outside of London to visit the workshop that exclusively crafts all of the firm's rough turned lasts and shoe trees, Peens. So Kirby, welcome to Henry Peen. This wow. is the site where we do all of our tree making okay. and all of our, a lot of the work that goes into the making of the lasts. Oh wow. If I'll introduce you to Matt, who is our workshop manager here. Hi, Kirby. Matt, hey, great to meet you. Yeah, great yeah. to meet you too. Thank you so much for having me out here. It's an honor and a privilege to, to finally see this part of the famous John Lobb's operation. I guess one of the things that I constantly find impressive about Lobb is just the provenance, right, of a pair of Lobb shoes. I mean, here you have the raw you know, blocks of wood that are being made into the rough turns that ultimately you carve into the customer's last. Instead of buying that from someone else, you guys are actually doing that, you know, from the raw blocks of wood here at Peen, and that's what we're we're here to see. Well, I think well, I just like to see that as a, as a hand craft and as a craft, mm -hmm. you are taking your raw material essentially, and creating your shoes. Yeah. Obviously, we don't tan the leather, mm -hmm. but we do um, almost everything else. <laughs> almost now we do almost everything else. I mean, obviously, traditionally the tree makers were a separate business. Obviously, yeah. that's now been incorporated into mm -hmm. our company. Um, but you're essentially starting from a raw material, a wood, yeah. <clears throat> it comes to us, and then we're making that up into the last, and then we're turning it on the lathes, mm -hmm. which you'll see later. Yeah, it's amazing, because, I mean, Lab is the only company that, the only shoemaker that I know of uh, that still manufactures its own last, 
right, versus outsourcing that. Uh, but I had no idea that you guys were actually doing the rough turns uh, for, yeah. you know, the, the raw I mean, the, the initial task is done in the shop. Obviously, yeah. the customer's foot's measured. Yeah. And then they'll make a, a last, uh, one last. Uh, but they will use a rough turn that we've made here. Okay. But we do a rough turn from, from this, basically, yeah. from a model. So walk us through the process. So a customer goes into the shop, they commission a pair of shoes. You know, Jonathan, you would take their, their measures on a piece of paper. Um, and then what happens from that moment? Well, as a last maker, I will take something that has been turned from this model. Okay. And it's a, we have a range of lasts which mm -hmm. are turned from the model. So this is the starting point. So you're not actually carving the last from a raw block of wood. You're doing a rough turn that gets you close. As if you saw, if you, I mean, we still have to glue them, but originally, mm -hmm. before these sort of rafts, they yeah. actually used those blocks. Yeah, they had yeah. those large bench knives, mm -hmm. and they would actually start from a larger block of wood. Yeah. But with the introduction of the turning lathes, mm -hmm. then this changed yeah. the process. Yeah. yeah, and that doesn't impact, you know, the final product at all. So this is mm -hmm. one of the ways that that industrialization has helped made it yeah. slightly more yeah. The industrial, yeah, that, this, this machinery yeah. was brought in, it was the turn of the 20th century, this yeah. was introduced. Yeah. So okay. at that time, when you've got to remember, when our company mm -hmm. was founded, we were, we predated that. Yeah, by 50, 60 years <laughs> at that point. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing. So where does this all start? So you've got a lot of incredible machines. Some of them look, you know, as old as the yeah. trade almost. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just but, about, yeah. But I imagine, you know, really probably not much has changed since the beginning. No, no. I mean, the, pro the process is pretty much the same. Thank <laughs> you. 
but nowadays that is what is given to a last maker. Okay. And then he will start from that point. Yeah. And he will wake, he'll make one last, and then it'll come back to the workshop to have the other last cop copied Fellowed, on the yeah. fellowed okay. on the machine. And talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, which is there a particular foot that you always begin with, the left or the right? Start with the bigger foot. Okay. <clears throat> bearing in mind that you don't want to, it's always better to take away rather than add. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you always easier. start with a larger size. So okay. you, in terms of the feet, you would go with the larger foot mm -hmm. and then you would copy the other foot. Yeah. And then and, you would work it down from there. Yeah. And then you end up with, you know, a final version of the one foot and then it would be sent back here. Mm -hmm. That would be duplicated. Uh, and then that would then go back and then you would finish yeah. it off. Then I'll have a pair of lasts and I would work mm -hmm. on those two lasts together. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the sort of most efficient way of doing it. Yeah. Obviously, you could start from two basic lasts in different ways, but that's the, the best way of doing it. But it's important for the two feet to be, you know, relatively symmetric, right? I mean, it's got to be a pair of shoes while still incorporating, <clears throat> you know, the individual differences between the feet. Yeah, there's always sometimes, depending on the feet, you're always trying to make a pair of shoes. Yeah. So it does help, technically, when you're copying something, mm -hmm. a replica, and that keeps you sort of focused on making them a pair. But, yeah. But they can sometimes be quite large differences between feet. So yeah. you just have to, that's just, that's the skill of last making. Yeah, absolutely. And making, you know, well-fitting shoes that are also beautiful. Exactly. <laughs>
Here we are, the famous benches inside of John Lobb. That's right. Yeah. So yesterday we were at Peen's and we saw the rough turn, right? So that gives us, you know, that, uh, that rough outline of the last that then is crafted into a bespoke last here uh, at the hands of a skilled last maker at John Lobb. That's right. Well, the, as I said, the, the machinery and process of Peen's is obviously mm -hmm. essential to giving me the tools yeah. and, and giving me the material I need to work with. Mm -hmm. Um, but as to, for the transition from the wood yeah. to a pair of last, which is suitable for a pair of shoes, mm -hmm. then that's something I've been working on and learning about for the last 30 years, and I, I continue to learn about. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that really distinguishes John Lobb is that uninterrupted accumulation of knowledge that's been going on for over, you know, 150 years almost, right? Being passed down as a tradition mm -hmm. from last maker to last maker to last maker, and um, yeah, I so said I learned from my father, and so I, I learned also from my colleagues around me, mm -hmm. and uh, various other craftsmen who have worked here in the past. Yeah, but I, I think I mean, or let me know what you think. I mean, whenever it comes to uh, a trade like bespoke shoemaking, what is effectively an oral trade, experience does matter, right? And especially that aggregation of experience, uh, it matters. Well, it's essential. I mean, a craft is by definition hand work. And you only learn by doing that work with your hands. Yeah. So it's not an all, you know, you can verbalize it as much as you like and romanticize it, but it's a hands on craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must be practiced. Must right? be practiced. Yeah. How does Lab approach its uh, training of last makers that might be different than what one would find uh, kind of this day and age? Well, I suppose our, it's, been it's been defined by the changing times. We've mm -hmm. in the past, last makers as a company when John Lobb was originally set up his business. Obviously he would have had skilled last makers coming to him mm -hmm. to work. And over time, you know, we've now got to a position where we have trained over the last 20 or 30 years, yeah. all of the craftsmen who currently work here. Mm -hmm. So we don't have obviously the source of craftsmen. The external craftspeople. Outside. Yeah. So our attitude is that you know, we, we train, survive as a company, but yeah. also to maintain and continue the craft. Yeah. And I think that's an important characteristic of Lob in and of itself. I mean, one of the reasons I think Lob is so important uh, to the trade is that in many ways, you know, Lob serves as, um, you know, the keeper of the trade. I mean, I think that, you know, all last makers, uh, modern last makers, I mean, most of them either trained here or were trained by someone that trained here. That does seem to be the case at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, you, you can't predict the future. You yeah. don't know what, what role craftsmanship will have in our mm -hmm. lives, in our future lives. And uh, yeah. you know, if, if we're not all thinking about other things, we might well turn to a yeah. more handcraft in the future. Yeah. Do you find that last making has a degree of trial and error, or is it really a practiced craft? Um, there's always trial and error, mm -hmm. but obviously you develop your craft through that yeah. mechanism. And obviously when you get to the point where you're <clears throat> producing a last for a customer, you would expect to have, yeah. have, it's not just a personal trial and error, but you're also, you, you have, you're passing on the experience of other people. Mm -hmm. What do you think, I mean, one of the things Lab is, of course, well known and famous for is being able to go straight to that finished shoe mm -hmm. and getting it right. Um, is that a, a product of the way that you approach last making? Is it a product of just the aggregate experience and knowledge that a firm like this has accumulated and retained? Well, it's all those things. <laughs> but we don't, you know, we don't get to the point of fitting a shoe thinking this is a question of trial and error. Yeah. You know, we have already applied the experience and the, that we have to yeah. that creation. Amazing. So where does it start? I mean, we took my measurements. Right, we've got that rough turn. Um, you know, to be able to actually see this is a, such a tremendous honor and privilege, I have to say. You know, five years ago, whenever I started the channel, I, I never would have expected to be standing here at John Lobb's mm -hmm. bench, seeing him actually craft a pair of shoe trees, or not shoe trees, but actually craft a pair of Well, you have a rather, for me. rather keen interest in the craft <laughs> itself, which uh, obviously, and the, what goes into the, into the, the yeah. behind the scenes. Well, this is the magic. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, you know, one of the beauties of, of uh, of course, the content that we're able to film in YouTube is really revealing and opening up this otherwise hidden aspect of the craft. Mm. Uh, that, for at least me personally, uh, is what I find so profound. I mean, there's no question that a pair of bespoke shoes is an investment. It's, it's expensive. But whenever you see that everything that goes into it, not just in terms of the amount of work, but the amount of just knowledge and tradition, 
uh, you know, they seem like a bargain. Well, it is when you look that way. I mean, the magic is that you, uh, an individual customer comes in, you take their measurements with a pen and a piece of paper. The same you, way that they've been taken. And you produce a pair of shoes which they then come back and they fit and they walk yeah. out with. And there's, there's a magic in that. Yeah. And not just fit and they walk out with, but that fit exceptionally well. Well, there's an ideal. Yeah. There's always an element of idealism to everything you do. Yeah. But uh, we, we do have confidence in what we do. Yeah. Well, great. Well, let's see kind of where this all begins. So these are my measurements. We took those. So these are the measurements. Um, you'll remember that um, at our Henry Peen, we they produced what was called a range of lasts. Mm -hmm. And as a last maker, the first thing, my first port of call is to get one of those sizes from that range, mm -hmm. the size which most sort of is, is closer to usually the either left or right foot, depending on which is the bigger. Okay. Because bearing in mind that then once you've whittled this down, you will then send it back to Henry Peen, mm -hmm. and they will make a copy of that shoe. Mm -hmm. so, so you want to get to a position where you have two single lasts, and you will then work on those together as a pair. Yeah, okay. So this is the rough turn. Mm -hmm. How many measurements did, did you take? Uh, but we take a basic outline. Mm -hmm. um, take a basic outline, we take three measurements, one across the joint, one across the instep, and then one from the heel to the top of the okay. instep. Obviously, when you see a pair of feet, you're then making little annotations as to little things. You might take a few more measures if you feel a bit uncomfortable about something. Yeah. Those are the sort of basic parameters that you're working around. Yeah. And how much of the craft uh, is, uh, you know, really going off of the measures? And how much of it is, you know, as the tailors would say, rock of eye, where you kind of see that final shape of the shoe and artistically work to create that? Well, it's, it's always a marrying the two things together. Mm -hmm. I mean, not everyone can do that, but yeah. it's, uh, that's what you're trying yeah. to do. Kirby, the first thing I'll do is I want to get this down to a comfortable place, mm -hmm. right, to, to then send it back to Henry yeah. Peen to have it followed. Depending on which one I've actually picked will depend on how much work I have to do. Yeah, okay. So the first thing I would do is shape, is to shape up the heel. Yeah. And so you're always starting with the last that's larger, of course, than the foot. That's right. And you're starting with the largest foot, generally. Yes. The largest of the feet. Yeah, but you don't want to end up with a fellow that is too small. Yeah. begin with, I'm just getting rid of sort of excess wood. I'll get the heel sitting comfortably in the measure, the joint sitting in the right place, mm -hmm. and then I will move on to the shaping of the toe. We'll see there is also your main other references, your, are your measurements. Mm -hmm. So in the process of going through the shape and also checking checking the measurements. So again I've got this joint measure which I want to take down by another quarter of an inch. I've got a instep measure which again I want to take that down on this last mm -hmm. and a heel measure. Again that will come down as well when I take this down. So. Constantly checking against the outline of the tracing. Yeah, I mean, even taking you know taking the width out here will take a good amount of measure out of mm -hmm. there. So if I if I'm happy with the the width, then I will take it off on the top. And so where do you think the intuition appears? You know, with the last maker that's been doing this for 30 years versus someone maybe that's just been doing it five. Well, I, I don't know. I suppose you have to compare what I do with someone who doesn't know what they're doing. <laughs> but, I, uh, I've, uh, but you've seen those people, I'm sure, come through. More, more often than not, they don't. You, there's a sense of uh, there is a certain quality to a last, which is a sort yeah. of fluidity to it, okay. which is quite hard to achieve. Mm. It's not just a series of as a three-dimensional object. It's, it has to sort of flow. One one yeah. thing flows into another because it is three-dimensional. 
The process of carving a last out of a solid block of wood is where the magic behind bespoke shoemaking begins. That today, a pair of shoes can be made using the same techniques as 150 years ago has always captivated me. A skilled last maker, like those practicing the trade at John Lobb, are, at the end of the day, artisans who marry the pragmatic objective of creating a comfortable, well-fitting shoe with the artistic objective of creating beautiful ones. More often than not, these two objectives are at odds with one another, and it is only at the hands of an experienced and skilled last maker that they can be balanced into making a beautiful, well-fitting, and comfortable pair of bespoke shoes. And as anyone who has had a pair of bespoke shoes made before knows, it is much more easily said than done. And this is where not only the tenure of Lobb's individual last makers, but the aggregation of experience at the firm itself shines through and shows why it has continued to thrive for over 150 years. It's a dramatic difference. I mean, much smoother and certainly more refined than where we were just 45 minutes or an hour ago. Well, I've taken this down. I said I've taken not just the outline and the toe. I've taken it all down to, it's not, I say it's not the final result because I'm not going to have that until I get back to that, but it will be close to where the measures are on the joint, yep. close to the instep measure and close to the heel measure. Um, yep. So this is that first last, right? The, mm. you know, in this case, the left, right? Yep. My larger foot. Mm -hmm. So you would you get it to a point where you're happy, right? You send it back to Peen. That's right. They turn the fellow, That's which right. is the, the other foot, the right foot in this case, yep. and then you bring those back and how much of the work is getting that right foot or the fellow to where it needs to be for the right foot? And how much of it is, is kind of harmonizing the two together? Well, it, again, it depends entirely on your measurements. Yeah. But as far as possible, you want, to, you want to get as close as possible with the first. Okay. Um, but there will inevitably, there will be differences between mm -hmm. the two and the width and the measurements yeah. and the length. So there's, they, the, the differences, as you progress, the differences become more subtle. Yeah. So you may not take this all the way to finish because you know that you need that extra room for the other foot. Exactly. You'd send it off to be, you know, duplicated yeah. and then you would finish it off. Yeah. Even then it's a question of the, the individual last maker will decide sort of what, how much allowance they yeah. want before they get a pair. Yeah. And what that stopping point is. So what are the important elements um, that, you know, as a last maker, someone that's been practicing this for so long, that you look for in the last to just know that you've gotten it right? <clears throat> Well, I, I'm, as I said, I've talked about the outline, mm -hmm. and I've talked about the measurements. Okay. But obviously when you're wearing a shoe, you've got to, you've got to feel balanced. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance in the last between the forepart okay. and the heel. So one of the things you always check as a last maker is the range, the range okay. of those. So that, that plane there needs to be on the same plane as the front. Mm -hmm. So you will check, check it from that side, check it from that side. The other it depends on the height of the heel. Your heel might be seven eighths of an inch high, mm -hmm. it might be inch and a quarter inch, inch okay. and a quarter. So again, you're checking the height of the heel in relation to the forepart. Yeah. So that height from there to there needs to be correct. Yeah. What about toe spring? I mean, that's another thing you hear. Well, and then toe spring, obviously that's the other side of it. You've okay. got your heel, your height for your heel, and you've got your joints, and then those obviously d will be determine the toe spring. But obviously you want a toe spring to be when you're walking, there's a little bit of allowance between the ground mm -hmm. and... Uh, you have to roll through. through so you're rolling yeah. through. Because otherwise, I mean, if there's no toe spring, right, uh, and I've got a pair of shoes that was deliberately made with not much toe spring, it can feel a little flat-footed. Well, I mean, depending on the flexibility of the shoe, you will simply find that the toe will turn up yeah. and the leather will crease. Okay. I mean, yeah. If it's a very stiff sole, obviously, then you find yourself walking on the toe, but it, mm -hmm. You've got to remember that the material itself is going to mold over time. Yeah. So you want to, you want to, <clears throat> it's, there's a dynamic quality to a shoe. Mm -hmm. If you bend it in one direction, something has to go in the other direction. And what about toe shape? I mean, is the toe shape, is the toe shape being built in at this stage? How much of the toe shape is a function of that stock model? And then of course, John Lobb is, you know, has its kind of iconic round toe shape. Mm -hmm. You know, how much of that 
is, I mean, does everyone get the round toe shape or is it completely up to customer preference? Well, or? it's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And we have a, there is a classic form to a toe shape. Yeah. And the round shape has always been the most traditional form. Mm -hmm. um, we were asked to do square toe shapes. Okay. And, but we also try to produce something which fits your foot. Okay. And you'll see in, in a lot of feet, a lot of shoes to get a nice shape, you have to push. You have to push in that side there. Mm -hmm. So, but, but however, inevitably, a lot of toes will be there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in some shoes, well, they will be made with You're a broader kind of toe shape. Them in. Yeah, they will be made with a broader toe shape mm -hmm. to allow for the foot to allow for to the foot to spread and to be comfortable. Yeah. Okay. So if it's too narrow, you, know, you can end up either having to what elongate the shoe in order to Sometimes still you, take into the account room for the toes, and then yeah. Well, those are the things you might if you uh, if you had a broad foot to try and give it a little the appearance of something a little bit smarter by making the toe a little bit longer mm -hmm. but again that has consequences on the yeah. on the actual shoe itself so yeah. you try not to try to avoid that you can yeah so what's next so here we are at this point uh, you'd send this off for the fellow so this will go back to Henry Peen and they okay. will make they will turn on the lathe they will turn a copy okay this, the reverse essentially yeah. and then that will come back to me and I'll work on on the two together mm -hmm. Seemingly insignificant, the fact that Lob turns all of its rough turns themselves in their own workshop is just one of the many examples of the firm's absolute commitment to practicing their trade properly. Like in so many ways at John Lob, the total is greater than the sum of the parts, and it is this characteristic that has made John Lob shoes the most prestigious in the world. Here we are, we've got, if we discussed that, we got to the point where we had the single last. Mm -hmm. We've sent it to Henry Peen. Mm -hmm. They've now sent back a fellow to that, okay. which I've got here. <clears throat> and this fellow, as you can see, is the reverse of this, of this single last. Mm -hmm. So I've now got the two lasts, a pair of lasts to work it with. Yes. And uh, it's a little bit different from actually making a single last because mm -hmm. now you're trying to match your mate you're trying to match you're trying to pair things up yeah obviously you're still referring back to the measurements mm -hmm. now of not both not just the left foot yeah. but the right foot so you're pairing them up you're working to the measurements mm -hmm. and again you it's a sort of another stage in the whole process of making a last yeah. making a pair of lasts pair of lasts and so this foot i mean this last of course still has to be you know taken back to the measures of that foot mm -hmm. uh, but then there's a degree of what just visual balance yeah. between them yeah again I'll go back to your your other foot and I'll look at that on your other foot and I'll and how would you say my right foot differs from the left so as you look at these two what would you do differently on this one than that well your feet are actually quite a good they're quite a pair okay um, your right toe possibly is a little bit straighter than the left okay but we do want to make an elegant looking pair mm -hmm. of shoes so in you know I want to make something which will push your toes in a little bit okay. and give you the look that you're looking mm -hmm. for. Again, I'm trying, I'm, I'm slightly defining what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's the skill of a, of a, a master craftsperson is knowing where to push, right? And occasionally I get to a point where I, I just can't give you what you want and I, <laughs> I have a battle. Yeah. <laughs> Again, first thing I will do is take, just take all any excess wood off the heel and the toe. I mean, the lathe helps get you close, but it's still quite crude. Well, it does. When you start working on it, you think, oh, there's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, it's not going to take it quite off, take it yeah. off quite as efficiently as yeah. those turning lathes. Yeah. <laughs> so again, the first step is just take off the excess and uh, so I'm always looking now now I'm referring not just to the draft and the single but I'm referring to the pair of lasts and I'm matching up the heels matching up the toes of this pair once you hand this last over to the closer mm -hmm. uh, well, and, he, and in turn they hand over their work to the maker yeah there's always a certain reassurance of seeing something which has a good shape and a good form. Mm -hmm. um, it gives them a certain confidence to do what they're doing. Yeah. They, and, you know, and you see any art, any piece of art, if you look at it, it's, uh, you know, it's encouraging when it's um, 
flows nicely yeah. and has a good form and has mm -hmm. a good shape. That yeah. sort of plays along all the way through the process. Yeah. And that experience really kind of, you know, carries on at every single step of the process. I mean, we, we saw Matt yesterday, who spent 40 years, you know, doing the rough turns in the shoe trees. Yep. Uh, you know, you've got 30 years, which is probably about average uh, here in this workshop amongst the last makers, mm -hmm. you know. Then we move to the pattern makers and the closers, mm -hmm. similar amount of profound experience. Yeah, and then it goes to mm -hmm. the actual makers that are, you know, making the shoe. I suppose what's Same interesting thing. about shoemakers is the, the, the skills and the, you know, the qualities involved at each stage uh, are physically very different. So yeah. a last maker would never be a good closer. Mm -hmm. not, not, not that there aren't, there are individuals who close and make and do lasts, but um, they're physically and mentally different, uh, yeah. different skills. I think, we're, I think we're, what is unique really about us now is that um, there are individuals, um, but the, the, most company, whether we are the, really the sole si company of any size, which purely retains its business as a craft. Mm -hmm. it's, we haven't gone into ready-made shoes as a family business. Um, that, uh, and you'll find that a lot of companies will incorporate the craft into the ready-made business, because then that, ha that helps to obviously maintain and sustain the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you find that by not doing that, that you're able to retain a more singular focus than on the craft without uh, distraction? Well, as a craftsman, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have our pair, and the final, final sort of last finishing of it is to do a final fine filing, okay. sand it down, mm -hmm. and write your name on it. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's what we can do okay. briefly. And show it. So at this point, are you still adjusting the shape, or is it just really smoothing the well, surface? Even at this point, you are still checking the measurements. Mm -hmm. You're checking the shape. You're just uh, doing a sort of fine, sort of just a little tweaking here and tweaking there. Smidgen. Smidge. Smidgen, smidgen here and smidgen there. Even I just might take a little bit off the bit there. Just smoothing it out so it's got a nice uh, surface. Just help define define those edges. Get that definition for the toe. So I'll then that point, put it down, I'll then sand the sand the pair down. Again, I'm still refining this sort of shape and making sure, the, make sure they're clear. You can see you're getting closer to that finish of a, that finish last. The John La brand, founded in 1849, based at number nine St. James's Street, run today by fifth generation Lobs, and who today continues to practice the traditions handed down to them originally by their great-great-grandfather is much more than just a bespoke shoemaking business. It is an authentic and unbroken connection to the past where the virtues and craft of a bygone era are given new life and purpose for today's discerning customers who truly value above all else quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. So, you might probably uh, undo the block and uh, just clean it off, and then the last thing it will do is write on the pair, that's his name. Wow, well, amazing. Look at that. Well, I have to say honestly, I never thought <laughs> I would be holding a last here at John Lobb with my name on it. Jonathan. It's all right, Kobe. Thank, thank you, you so much.
My pleasure. This is um, what an incredible honor and privilege, and uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Mm -hmm. And so what would be next then? So this is the last, we've got a pair. We will next, that'll be passed on to the closer. Okay. And they will make a paper pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, those patterns will be returned to the, what we call the clicker. Okay. And the clicker again, is it is actually a skill, it's, it's a right to people who deal with the materials, mm -hmm. and look after the leather. So they will cut out the leather for the closer, mm -hmm. and return the patterns and the leather to the closer, and the closer will then make the uppers. Okay, so the uppers are sewn together, mm -hmm. and then it's kind of bundled together with all the trimmings, the outsole, the insole, mm -hmm. the hard counters. Well, then they will pass it on to what we call the rough stuff cutter, okay. who, like the clicker, deals with the materials okay. for the soles. And so the material for the soles. And He's the called the what? The rough stuff. Rough stuff. Essentially yeah. Yeah. cuts out the material, the rough yeah. stuff, for the maker. Okay. So they cut it out roughly for the mm -hmm. maker. So we call it stuff yeah. that's rough. And uh, <clears throat> it's all very literal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, again, that's the lasts and the uppers are passed on to that rough stuff cutter, who again, there's a skill involved in selecting the leather from, yeah. from the hides and then mm -hmm. putting it together and passing it on to the maker. Yeah. And the maker is obviously the traditional image of the yeah. shoemaker sitting mm -hmm. there, sort of putting the soles, yeah. doing the heels. Right? Jonathan, okay. thank you so much. It's a great copy. Yeah. Thank you. And I guess this is kind of the point at which we have to make some commitments. Yes. Well, we're going to, we're going to look at the style. Obviously, the work we'll do will be based on your choice. Yeah. From that, from those styles. Yeah. So where does it go from here? Well, I will pass these on to the um, closer, who also makes the patterns. Okay. So they'll be, the closer will be given the lasts. Mm -hmm. They will make the paper patterns. So those patterns will then be given to the clicker. So the clicker will then bundle the leather for the shoe together, and they'll give it back to the closer, mm -hmm. who will then essentially close those pieces together and stitch okay. it all together. So okay. we'll be left with the pair of uppers, uppers. and the lasts.